Hey, Meg and Dr. G here, and we are so excited to have the renowned sports sociologist, Dr. Jay Coakley, from the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs, with us today. Jay spent more than 45 years studying sports culture, and his textbook, Sports and Society, Issues and Controversies, is likely the most widely used text in the world on sports sociology. And as an international respected scholar, author, and journal editor, Jay has received many awards on his journey to make sports participation a source of enjoyment and development for young people around the world. Jay, welcome. We're delighted to have you join us today. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for coming, Jay. I, I, I think as a new show, too, having somebody with your reputation and for those looking to understand sport better, uh, your sport and society textbook for right all the listeners you know it, it's monumental i mean you know the history of sociology of sport and you published the first uh edition what in 1970 78 yeah in fact three sociology of sport textbooks came out in 1978 simultaneously what was happening in the 70s then that everybody was writing those books that's interesting when multiple people published the same kind of topic at the same time i think that that Commercialization was having major Im major impact on how sports were organized, how people defined sports, how young people saw their future in sports, and people started asking some critical questions about how sports were organized, where they were going, what they should be like in the future, and uh, and that excited people with backgrounds in sociology to uh, to start looking at sport with a critical eye. What does a sports sociologist do? You know, what does that mean to be a sports sociologist? Yeah, well, basically, a sports sociologist studies the connections between sports and the culture and society within which sports exist. And uh, they also focus on the social worlds that are created in and around sports. So basically, we're concerned with how society and culture influence how sport is organized and who gets to play. Who doesn't? Who's excluded? A gender, gender relations in society, race and ethnic relations, uh, socioeconomic class. Uh, whose games get to count within society in terms of how they're funded, supported, for example, in school systems? And also, uh, who has the power to make those decisions? And what are the power dynamics that, that are associated with with sports and society? Those things sound like things that have changed quite a bit over the last 45 years as you've been as you've been studying this yeah it's you know when when sports were first organized uh in the late 19th and early 20th century uh they they basically had a reality that was confined to the locality within which they exist but uh, but since that time, sports have become increasingly institutionalized. And that's a sociological term that basically means that they've become more formalized, uh, the, the rules have become more standardized, the game uh, looks the same in various places where it's played. So sports have, have basically become more organized over the past century and a half. And... Uh, and and now we're starting to critique that organization. Has that happened more in the U.S. than in other countries? Has it? I, thinking about soccer, you know, you, you go to a lot of Latin American countries, and they still have you know the pickup game, and the, everyone has a soccer ball, and they're just out having fun with soccer. And yet, in the U.S., my experience, my daughter plays soccer, and she um, she's constantly you know having to have a field, have a you know, have a team together. Are you on club? Are you on, you know, AYSO? It, it just seems like the organization has kind of taken it over. Yeah, that's, that's happened over the past 40 years. And basically in the United States, we've seen what some people refer to as the death of the culture of childhood play. And uh, along with that, uh, there has been uh, far fewer informal games played by young people. And it's related to, in many ways, the commercialization of sport and the fact that we use these commercial models of sports. And we have a word for that in sociology, prolympic sports. Oh. It's a model based on professional and elite amateur sports. And those sports are now used as the standard against which all sport forms are measured and evaluated. I 
always thought that safety kind of played into it. Uh, as I was growing up, there was a, a shift from just letting your kids run around and, and um, do whatever to kind of like, we need to keep an eye on you. There's, there's bad people out there. Yeah, and I think that awareness of, of the dangers in the world has increased with the way news has oh. been covered. Uh, and interestingly, the world has gotten increasingly safer for young kids over the past 40 to 50 years. But the sense that it's danger, dangerous for kids has increased tremendously after the, over the past 40 to 50 years. Yep. I think, I think that's one of the most interesting things that a uh, historical sociological lens can offer people is to look at those weird contradictions. So kids are safer today, but yet we are afraid to let them go play at the park or go down the street or play pickup, you know, on their own. Uh, but we're also calling them snowflakes. What we've seen is that parents and parental moral worth now is tied to what happens to their children. and. So parents today are held responsible for the whereabouts and the behavior of their children 24-7, 365 days a year. And that is the first time in human history that parents have ever been held to that expectation. And it's driving parents crazy and it's driving kids crazy too. I can attest to that. It is driving us crazy. And I can, I'm sure my kids will agree. Yeah. It's driving them crazy too. <laughs> uh, and, and parents uh, are super sensitive to this. And so what they do is they try to find adult organized and adult supervised programs for their kids so that when they get out of school, they go to their youth uh, sport practice or their dance lessons where adults are in charge. So now if a parent just lets their 10 and 12 year old walk together to the park, somebody's gonna call social services or the police. And you know, it's gotten so bad in some communities that parents have gotten together and formed what they call free range children clubs, oh, wow. where they actually allow their children to explore a little bit of the world on their own rather than being on this leash. And it's, it seems very odd. You almost have to think twice about it. It's like, is this safe? Because this is not normal where it, it should be much more normal. And I remember the joy I felt, you know, having my kids go, I'm going to Johnny's house and, and them being able to have that kind of independence. Right, and that really ties to what's happened with youth sports uh, because youth sports used to be neighborhood based. Uh, kids used to be able to ride their bikes. They didn't need parents to drive them to and from practices and games. Mm -hmm. And uh, so now what's happened is that instead of communities sponsoring sports through park and recreation departments, what we have is parents and families are sponsoring sports. And that has had a major impact on how kids see their own sport participation. They see it as tied to their family rather than tied to their own community and neighborhood. And that has implications for how they grow up, how they see their connection to their own community and neighborhood. Those connections have become less uh, obvious to young people than they were in the past. And I think that's impacted the extent to which we participate in our communities. Yeah, does, it, does, does, that, does any of that really matter to you? Let's answer that question, right? Does that really matter or make a difference? You know, today's age, okay, you know, kids are playing less, but they've, got more structure and we've got more opportunities for them you know uh, things are better nowadays too you know, what's your, what do you say yeah. to something like that well maybe we don't have as many opportunities and you know that's one of the things that's happened along with some of these changes is that uh, a lot of our youth sport programs have become more segregated by social class uh, because we have moved from uh, low cost and free publicly funded programs that existed from the 1950s all the way through the 1970s and much of the 80s. And now we've moved to a pay-to-play uh, private uh, youth sports system that's much more exclusive and your participation depends on your ability to pay. Mm -hmm. So what's happened is that uh, kids from upper middle class and wealthier families have great access to youth sport participation opportunities, whereas kids in lower income groups don't. 
And uh, what, what that has done is not only uh, cut access for a good percentage of the young population, but it's also limited the pool of talent from which we can draw as kids get older and are trying out for high school and college and Olympic teams and professional teams. So what we're seeing is college programs being predominantly white and upper middle class, except for the revenue generating programs like football and men's basketball, women's basketball, and maybe a couple of others, ice hockey in, in some places. And the irony of it is that the revenues generated by those kids from the lower income families are actually funding the scholarships that, that the kids from upper income families have. Now, that, that model doesn't apply to all programs because a lot of football and basketball programs don't make money, but that's, that's the way things are, at least in the top 65 to 75 schools and the universities in the country right now. Has yeah. that changed much? I, mean, I kind of always have thought that was the case. Yeah. Well, it's changed dramatically over the past six or seven years with the big media contracts. Mm. And, you know, college football and college basketball are major spectator events. Uh, these contracts, you know, over a, a number of years, you know, it's a $2 billion contract. So, for example, uh, the schools in the Big Ten are getting $52 million a year wow. just from their TV contracts. Now, about 20 to 30 million of that is spent by the football and basketball programs, but uh, the other 20 to 30 million are going to fund mm -hmm. the programs that are predominantly white with kids from predominantly upper income families. How do you know that? What's your, what's your evidentiary claim? Where's your evidence for that claim? Yeah. That, <laughs> Well, you know, you can you can look at a lot of you can look at a lot of pictures in in the uh, uh, turn on the TV, would you? In the <laughs> well, you gotta ask. I gotta ask the evidence side. I yes, gotta be scholars. Yeah. We don't yeah. just make things up. And people right. are listening too, and they're gonna go, well, you know, that's just his opinion, or you know, well, I don't I don't see that either. So there's evidence, and I know there's evidence too. So what right. is that evidence? Yeah, the evidence is that we certainly know because of the data gathered by by universities. Uh, uh, what racial and ethnic group uh, people come from. And, uh, and we also have information on the socioeconomic status of their families. And we know that uh, the football and basketball players are coming from families generally that are, have lower incomes than divers and golfers and swimmers and, uh, and uh, lacrosse players and, and others. Mm -hmm. Let me, let me continue on that kind of thread and bring in uh, the work of C. Wright Mills and the sociological imagination, and as well as defining personal troubles versus social issues is one of the key kind of work that people cite from Mills's work. And it sounds like you, know, you feel that this is a key social issue. Right. So I wonder if you might talk a little bit about why this is an issue, right? Like, why don't we just have the free market do its thing? and it, it's already working effectively you know it's the spectators like you said are out there watching sports they're the ones paying for all this stuff they get what they want uh you know if you're going to interfere with it or if you got a problem with it that's your personal problem it's not really something that warrants uh social issue or uh, the government regulation or something like that right yeah and in the united states there is a tendency to see those kinds of problems as personal problems rather than as social issues so yeah. if somebody doesn't have access to participation then what we need to do is we need a pro athlete develop a little program where they they create sport programs in in a local community and give some of those kids opportunities but that's just focusing in on personal problems and and that's not bad uh, that's good, but it's not solving the social issue that we have across this country where young people from lower income families and living in certain areas of, of large cities especially, and in rural areas too, where, uh, where systemically they just don't have access to the same kinds of opportunities as kids in upper middle class areas. And, and you can see that. Uh, uh, just when you talk with kids and you watch uh, who, who's participating in, in most of these pay-to-play programs, 
They're people who are driving around $60,000 SUVs. Mm -hmm. They're people who can take off time from work because they have the kinds of jobs that give us give them certain kinds of discretionary time. They're not working by the hour, where if they leave, they have to punch out and they have to have a note from their doctor in order to go take their kids from the, to a practice. So, uh, so we're talking about transportation issues. We're talking about ability to pay fees. Uh, uh, we're talking about uh, access to. Uh, the kinds of equipment that you need in order to participate at the elite kinds of levels that exist in these pay-to-play programs. So what is the answer then? How do we make that, that change? Well, that is a, it's becoming uh, defined as a social issue now because uh, obesity rates have, have increased over the past 40 years in, in the United States. So we have a major health problem related to the inactivity of a proportion of our young people in this society, and that inactivity is more likely to exist among lower income uh, uh, kids than, than kids from upper income families. Part two of our conversation with Dr. Jay Coakley is waiting for you now. Check it out, and as always, we love to get your comments. Let's get this conversation started.